Amen. Our God is alive. We are here to celebrate that. God gives us the very breath that we breathe. And let's take that breath and let's sing it out to him. Let's worship together about the greatness of our God. As Christians have been singing for generations and generations, that same great God has caused atonement for our sin. We cry out to him. And we can sing this song we've been singing for generations over and over, that it is well with my soul, because whatever may come, Christ has ultimate victory. Let's sing this song together. It is well.
song that we've been singing a lot at our church just because it's it's such a powerful truth to me is we can all look inside of ourselves and know the uh, the depths of sin in our heart but when we look toward God his mercy and his grace is always more it's always more than the depths of our sin and let's sing this song together his mercy is more praise the Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you for this time where we can gather together. What a privilege it is to gather with other believers and to worship you and to hear your word proclaimed. Jesus, may you be glorified in the service as your word is opened. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Yeah. Well, amen. Wow, what an incredible time of worship, Matt, and your team just flat knocked it out of the park. Would you give God the glory for that? Amen. Thank you so much, man. Wow. What an incredible time of worship, man. I'm telling you, it was worth the drive for me just to come and worship. I don't know if the preaching's going to be any good, but I'll tell you, the singing sure was. Amen. To God be the glory. Uh, I bring you greetings from Gardendale First Baptist, Birmingham, Alabama. And we are blessed to be here tonight. I'm going to tell you, it's my honor, my privilege. I love your pastor and his precious wife. Uh, we run in together often. A lot of times we'll run into each other at the Southern Baptist Convention, run around the hallway somewhere or something like that. And I sure love Brother Tim and his precious wife, Miss Kim. And they're a, they're a precious couple for the Lord. And I'm honored and humbled to be here tonight. Thank you, brother. I looked at all those preachers and I thought, man, I'm just, I'm just glad to be in the middle 
middle of those folks. Let me tell you, you're in for a great treat. I know uh, Rock began, and it go like, tomorrow. Next week is going to be Ken Witt, and Ken's a dear friend of mine, a pastor in Florida for many, many years. And so, don't miss next week. You will certainly love that. So, Pastor, thank you for inviting me back, man. I'm telling you, it's one thing to be invited once; it's another thing to be invited back. And so, I'm honored to be back. And I love this place, and I love you. It's such a joy. I love the passion the energy, the enthusiasm. And I want to thank you for, for trusting me to preach in your pulpit. I know you don't take that lightly. I know as a pastor uh, that you uh, are very cautious about who you have stand and preach in the pulpit. So thank you for trusting me. And I, I want to tell you, I, I, he's the shepherd. If I say anything he disagrees with, you go with him, and then God will straighten him out later. Amen? So... Uh, <laughs> No, I'm teasing, but I mean this. I'm, really, I'm under your authority, brother, and I believe in that. And thank you for inviting me to be here. Kim, so good to see you again. God bless you. And what a wonderful time of worship tonight. I'm glad you're here. I want to preach. I want to jump right on the message, if I may. Um, I want to speak to you on four characteristics of real revival. Your pastor invited me some time ago to be here. And I just, my wheels had been turning, been praying, God, what, what, do you, what is it that you want me to share with those precious people that I've shared with my people and I just think about in the day and age that we're in, if there was ever a time, I'm not going to spend a lot of time convincing you, I think there was ever a time that we needed revival. My church, your church, my city, your city, my state, your state, our nation, if there was ever a time we needed revival, could I, could I get a, a hand raise or an amen? We need revival, don't we? I'm, just, I'm not trying to be alarmist, but we're in a mess. Our nation is in an absolute mess. And I tell my folks, I've said it a hundred times, that I'm going to tell you, the, the president now or who the president will be in January is not the answer. The only answer we hope is in God Almighty. I lift my eyes onto the hills from where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord. And we're in a mess, but there's nothing, listen, that mess is not too deep and too big that God Almighty cannot send a mighty movement of His Spirit, a revival. It reminds me of this, this couple that needed a revival in their marriage. They were struggling for some time. Some of you may have felt that sting in marriage from time to time. And the wife said, we need to go get counseling. Well, the fellow, you know, he, did, he wasn't up on counseling much. And so finally she convinced him, and they finally went and sat down with this counselor. And the wife just began to unload to the counselor about her husband. Man, I'm telling you, my husband, he never helps around the house. He never takes out the trash. He never does the dishes. He never mows a yard. He don't do anything but just lay on the on the couch and watch ESPN. He don't, and I'm just, she just went on and on. Finally, the counselor had all he could take. He stood the wife up. He leaned her back, and the counselor gave the wife the kiss of her life. Man, he stood her back up, her eyes as big as silver dollars, smile as big as the moon, right? And the counselor looks at the husband and the husband, that's what your wife needs. And he said, is that all I can bring her by every Tuesday and Thursday? And, I don't know if you really understood, but I do want to tell you, we need revival, don't we? We need a mighty move of God. Now listen, one of the greatest revivals you've ever heard about is found in Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. It's, what, it's the revival we call at the church at Antioch. They had this incredible move of God. And out of this text of Scripture, just tonight, I just want to focus in very briefly on four characteristics of real revival. If my church, if your church, if Matt's church, if, if my community, your community is going to experience a revival, these four characteristics will be involved. Number one, Acts chapter 11, verse 19, there'll be difficult times. <laughs> Interesting. Acts chapter 11, verse 19, if you found it, uh, I'll read it to you. Acts 11, verse 19. Acts 11, 19. And here's what the Word says. Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the Word to no one but the Jews only. Stop right there. Watch this now. Those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen... So now we're in Acts chapter 11. Be okay if I come down here where you're at, all right? Acts chapter 11. This great revival. We're going to read about it in a minute. It's incredible revival. Folks are being saved. Lives are being changed. There's great joy in the city. I mean, God's in the house. Can I get an amen? That's Acts chapter 11. Now remember now, it's referencing a persecution of Stephen. Now you won't have to turn there, but I, if you go back three chapters to Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, it talks about the, this first deacon. It talks about Stephen, who's not only persecuted for his faith, he's literally killed for his faith. And if you go back, well, 
you just go back and look at it. If you go back and look at Acts 1, it says, and, and devout men carried Stephen to burial. That's Acts 8, 2. And they made great lamentation. They grieved over him greatly. Verse 3 says, now as for Saul, here it is now, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging of men and women, committing them to prison. So now here's what happens. They, they, they divide the church. They dis, they, we use the word disperse. They disperse the church, okay? So he, this is in Acts chapter 8, right? Stephen gets, we okay? Here, let me push this down. I'm spitting on it. Okay, here we go. Hope I don't have COVID. Anyway, so you might want to clean this before, before Ken uses it next week. Anyway, so, so here's what's happening, right? So, so there's this great persecution. Stephen is actually killed for his faith. And Saul now begins to, the Bible uses the word wreck havoc. He begins to persecute the church. And one way he does that is he disperses the church. In other words, he says, you know what? These believers are, they're, they're gaining great confidence and courage by being together. So if we could disperse them, if we could scatter them, they would lose their courage and this, this Jesus thing would be snuffed out. And so they took these dear precious believers right here, these precious ladies, and moved them over here. And they took these precious believers and moved them over here. And they took these precious believers and moved them over here. And they took some of them and put them in jail. And, and so they're scattering the church thinking what's going to happen is it's going to kill the church. But it did not kill the church. It spread the church. By the way, you can't kill the church of Almighty God. Can I get an amen? <laughs> <laughs> you can't even shut us down. You can't shut down the church of Almighty God. Even though we may not physically come together, I'm going to tell you, we are still the church of Almighty God. And it's so good, incredible to see this great crowd tonight. So there was this, there was this scattering that was happening because of the persecution. Now, it's interesting, Pastor. It's interesting that this revival at Antioch began with a persecution. What the enemy meant for harm, <laughs> come on now somebody, God took it and used it for our good and for His glory. It's an incredible thought. See, here's the way, I, here's, I was saved when I was eight. You, you don't know a lot about me. I was surrendered to the ministry when I was 11 years old. I, I didn't know what it meant then. I'm still trying to figure it out, but I, I was 11 years old. And so interesting because I got this idea, Pastor, that if we were going to have revival, you've probably been there. We're going to have, I love this spectacular, what is this, spectacular Sundays? Oh, I love that. Because I've been here before on marvelous Mondays, right? And I, I guess I'll be here if you have terrific Tuesdays or, or, or wacky Wednesdays, right? Or what else can we, uh, thrilling Thursdays, freaky Fridays, wouldn't that be good? Come to church, wouldn't that be awesome? We're going to have freaky Fridays, we're going to praise God. Anyway, so... But, so, uh, where am I at? Anyway, so I had this idea early on in ministry that if I could create the environment in the church where everything was just perfect, I mean, the conditions were just right, then maybe God would show up. There was no conflict. There was no gossiping. There was no backbiting. Man, there was great passion, and people were worshiping God and sharing their faith, and there was great harmony, and there was great unity. And man, it, it, the circumstances, the ingredients were just exact. If, if we got everything, all the wrinkles ironed out, we got everything just absolutely perfect, then maybe, just maybe, maybe God would show up. Then That's how I used to think. But when I look at the Word, I realize that God shows up in the midst of chaos and conflict. And I mean, just think about some of the great stories of the Bible, right? It's when we get to the end of ourselves that we realize what we're doing isn't working. And so we finally say, I love that scripture in Second Chronicles, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And I would say that's where we're at. That's where we're at as Americans, right? We don't know what to do. We've tried legislation. It doesn't work. We've tried government. It doesn't work. We've tried education. It doesn't work. God, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Think about the word. Think about the word. Here's Daniel in a lion's den, and God showed up. Amen. Here's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in a fiery furnace, and God showed up, right? Here's Paul and Silas stuck in jail, and all of a sudden there's an earthquake. That was just an accident. Are you serious? Are you kidding me? God shows up. I mean, here's David, little, little teenage David standing before this giant nine-foot Goliath, right? And he's got a slingshot. And what happened? God shows up. I mean, on and on the list goes. I, I could recount every story. Here's Jesus hanging on a cross. But God showed up. 
I'm telling you that revival happens during difficult times. So if you've got some issues in your life, if, if you're going through some struggles, if your church is anything like my church and we're not hitting on all cylinders maybe, and, and maybe we need a move of God, maybe things aren't swell, maybe things aren't exactly perfect, I want to tell you, we are a prime candidate. You are a prime candidate for a mighty move of God. It happens during difficult times. Can I get an amen from the church? By the way, if you don't ever have any difficult times, you're not spiritual, you're weird. <laughs> I wonder, I worry about these Christians that, well, I just walk by faith, I don't have any trouble, no trials, no heartaches. Are you serious? What world are you living in? <laughs> Nuts, man, I'm telling you. Because all of us have issues and problems. God never designed the church to be a museum for saints, always a hospital for sinners. So I tell our folks, look, if you don't have any issues or problems, don't join our church. We'll mess you up. You know, we, we got some issues. And I feel like your church is kind of like my church. And I'm looking around this church. I can tell some of you got issues. Some of you got more issues than others, right? Look at your neighbor, all right, six foot apart. Look at your neighbor and whisper. Just look at him. Put on a smile on your face and just look at him and tell him you've got issues. Go on, tell him, would you? Yeah. I like, I, I see, I can tell the married folks been married a long time, 30, 40, 50 years, because the husband will look at his wife and say, no, I ain't telling her that, preacher. I got, I got to go home with her. I ain't, I, saw, I ain't telling her that. Yeah. Uh, here's the bottom line. We all have issues. Can, can we just take our religious mask off a moment? I, we all have issues, right? I could, listen, I can remember, past. you probably relate to this with your girls when they were younger. Some of our best arguments happened on the way to church. I'm the pastor, right? I'm trying to be real spiritual, right? And I'm headed to church. I'm trying to be in a spiritual mode. And, and yet the kids are fighting and fuzzing. I got three of those girls. That's what's all this great. My, my youngest said to me, that she's a senior now. It's a credit. And she said to me, Dad, you need to dye your hair. I said, no, I want people to know what it's cost me to live with four women. My, <laughs> my wife and three daughters. And I tell you, trying to get to church on time, oh, it was such a hassle. I'd get up, I'm ready, I'm shaved, dressed, man, I'm ready to go. And they're going through all their rigmarole, right? I'm telling you, incredible. An hour and a half later, they finally come dragging it. I can remember when the kids were younger, they get in the back seat and they'd fight and fuss all the way. Your kids are more spiritual, but mine fight all the way to church. And arguing, she's touching me, she's looking, she's breathing my air, daddy. And I'm trying to memorize scripture on the way to church, and I'm trying to be spiritual. She's back there screaming. She's breathing my air. She's touching me. I'd say, I'm going to touch somebody. We're going to church. Now get spiritual. <laughs> right. And we pull in that church parking lot, been arguing all the way to church, and open the door, and somebody'd walk by, and I'd say, good morning, brother. How you doing? <laughs> and then I'd say, we're going to finish this later. Be quiet. Right? And you laugh. Why? Because most of you have been there at some. Some of you were there tonight. I saw you out in the parking lot. I saw you. And you didn't know who I was, but man, some of you having some good arguments in the parking lot. Some of you, one of y'all getting a kid out and hit his head on the door. Yep, one of y'all, who was that? What, one of y'all, anybody here going to confess up? I don't know who. Okay, I don't know who it was, but anyway. Hey, bottom line, I'm just telling you that, I'm just saying that revival happens. It's odd. It happens during difficult times. What a great time it would be for God to show up and show out right now in our nation. Amen. What a great time for revival. I tell my folks it's always a good time for God to show up. Amen. Amen. Difficult times. But secondly, I want you to know there'll be Jesus preaching. There'll be a focus on Jesus. Look at it, verse 20. It's the very next verse. It depends on the translation, the version that you use. But notice how verse 20 puts it. Acts 11, verse 20. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. There'll be difficult times, and there'll be, I just put down, I wrote in my notes, there'll be Jesus preaching. I'm going to tell you, when you're going to have revival, there's going to be a focus on Jesus. 
is going to be a lot less concerned about who the preachers are and who's leading the music and what kind of facilities are you on and what kind of programs do you have and what kind of buildings do you have. And it's going to be a lot less focus on the programs and the people and the staff and the preacher. There's going to be a focus on Jesus because the Bible says if we will honor Jesus, God will honor those who honor his son. And I'm going to tell you, in the end, it doesn't matter. It's all about Jesus because I can't save your soul. Preacher cannot forgive your sins. This church cannot set your life straight and set the addicts free. Only Jesus Christ can do that. Jesus and Jesus alone can forgive your sin and heal your soul and put the pieces of your broken life back together. Only Jesus Christ can do that. That's why I love I love the music tonight, man. I love the worship because you focused on Jesus. We talked about how great our God is and how awesome our Savior is because it's always about Jesus. It's Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the evening, and Jesus at noontime. There's nobody like Jesus. Man, I wish I had the words to tell you how awesome Jesus is. There's nobody like Jesus. There's nobody bigger. There's nobody better. There's nobody stronger than Jesus. He is the Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the Rose of Sharon. He is the Lily of the Valley. He is the fairest of 10,000. Oh, there's nobody like Jesus. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's nobody like Jesus. Come on, amen. Yeah. It's one thing I appreciate about your ministry here at Grace Baptist and your pastor, Brother Tim. He's going to preach Jesus. I love this church because you're going to sing about Jesus. You're going to teach about Jesus. You're going to focus on Jesus. Because when your life is falling apart, your family may be a help. Your friends can be a support. But there's nobody who can put your life back together like Jesus. There's nobody like him. You want revival, church? I do. I'm going to tell you, the focus won't be on the preachers. The focus won't be on the worship. Well, if we just sing, if we had this facility, if we had this, you know, smoke and lights, and if we had the way. No, no, let me tell you something. What we need more of is Jesus. That's what I need, what you need, what your church needs, what my church needs. We need more. You, you focus on Jesus, revival's possible. Number three, I've only got four. You okay? You all right? Look at your neighbor and ask him, are you okay? You all right? All right, number three, there'll be God's power. Watch verse 21. And the hand of the Lord was with them. Would you, would you read that with me tonight, church? Could we read just that first phrase there? You ready? And the hand of the Lord was with them. Question, aren't you tired of... God's church trying to do God's work without God's power. If there was ever a time that my church, your church, needed the power of Almighty God, it is now. I was thinking about this traveling here. I don't know why I put, I put this address in my GPS in, in Birmingham, and it led me a different way. In fact, I, I didn't know till about... 15 miles, whether I was even on the right road or not. 15 miles from here, because I, I hadn't seen a sign for Tullahoma at all. I didn't know what, and I, I don't know exactly where I came from, but somehow I made it here. <laughs> uh, I came up an entirely different way than I had. It took me over to Huntsville, if you are, and, and all the way, is that the best? And all the way over, and then I, I went over the river and through the woods from there. I don't know, but I, I'm not sure. I just saw tractors and cows, and I thought maybe I'm. <laughs> I'm, I, maybe I'm getting close. I, don't, I got a little nervous. I thought about calling Brother Tim and saying, Brother Tim, I don't, I'm in Arizona somewhere. I don't know where I'm at, you know. <laughs> but anyway, I, and I was thinking about this on the way over here because I was traveling down these roads, beautiful roads, incredible, you know, countryside. And, just, and I was noticing one church after another. Just, just notice that sometime. Forget about denominations for a minute. Just drive around, just drive around, and just notice there's a church, and there's a church, and there's a church, and there's a church, and there's a church. And you could see some of them had been around a long time. Their buildings were there, and you'd see signs for brand new churches. You know, I'd say in every movie theater and every department store and every vacant building now, there's a church plant. They're all over the place. Church, church I, I want to tell you, churches are everywhere. Listen to this. We have more churches than we've ever had, but we have a bigger mess than we've ever had. 
Now, I'm not against planting churches. I'm really for planting churches in unchurched areas, but I won't go down that road. I just want to say this. I'm not against planting churches, but I'm going to tell you planting churches is, alone is not the answer. The only answer is when the church of God begins to focus back on the Son of God. And we begin to lift up Jesus. And we preach Jesus. And we teach Jesus. And we sing Jesus. I'm going to tell you the hand of the Lord was with them. I don't know if, if you've experienced this. Pastor, I don't know, Brother Tim, if you... But over the weeks and months as this pandemic has continued to just kind of carry... You know, f for a week or two... It was all right. Hey, we all got to go home. We thought, this, is, this, this ain't bad. You know, it's, a, it's okay. And then, then we had to try to stay alive with our spouse. You know, after a while, it's in these, these kiddos that were fun for the first three days. After a while, they think, okay, let's go back to school now. You know, they, you know and, and after, and, 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 and church, you know, now we're just kind of like, I don't know, I don't know where you all were. Did you ever just live stream or did you all always... You did, yeah, we did the same thing. We live streamed for a long, just for a while, and that's all we did. And we're back now meeting like you guys are too. And, and I, I, it was just as I mingled with my folks and contact them, as I rubbed shoulders like you have with other pastors. And, you know, I, I, I get a sense as this pandemic continues to kind of carry on. It doesn't seem to go away. It's kind of like the flu. It's here. We're going to have to learn to live with it. And okay. What I have sensed from the church, from God's people, for many of them, it's kind of a sense of discouragement. Um, even, I would say, even disillusionment. What, what, what's happening? This is not the, this is, I didn't, I didn't, this was okay for a month. <laughs> it's not okay anymore. I, the walls are closing in on me. On me and I, I just, I'm overwhelmed with anxiety and stress. They tell us suicide's an all-time high. And anxiety is, 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 is off the charts. It's incredible. And, and if we're not careful, the church of God finds themselves kind of overwhelmed with what's going to happen. This world is so wild. And what we saw on TV looks like third world country, doesn't it? You can't imagine that. That's happening. That's in America. That, and there's this sense of lostness. There's this sense of hopelessness. And I just want to remind you, hey, God is still on his throne. He is not taken by surprise. And I'm going to tell you, when the church of God begins to operate in the power of God, Jesus said, Jesus said himself, on this rock, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of Almighty God. The Bible says, the power of God unto salvation. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. One Roman is 116. Why? It is the power of God unto salvation. I don't care how wild and how wacky and how weird this world gets. I don't care how dark and how discouraged and how depressing this world gets. Listen, my home is still on the coming. I'm, listen, this is not my home. I'm telling you I've got a home coming. I'm not concerned just about this world. I know who I belong to. I belong to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So don't be discouraged, child of God. Don't be discouraged, senior saint. Don't be discouraged, widow, widower. Don't be discouraged, young person, wondering what this world's coming to. Hey, let me remind you, God Almighty is still on his throne. And when the church of God begins to operate in the power of God, the devil and all his demons tremble. The power of God. The hand of the Lord was with them. Boy, I'd love for them to say that about our church. I'm going to tell you something about that Gardendale First Baptist. They're not perfect. they got a wacky pastor, but let me tell you something. The hand of the Lord is with them. I don't know how to tell you this, but when you pull in the parking lot, you can sense the power, the favor of God. You can, you can just sense, man, God is in the house. You want revival? There'll be God's power. Number four. There'll be obvious results. Obvious results. Watch what happens now. Verse 22 in our text. And so the Bible says, And news of these things. News of what things? Well, that they were preaching Jesus. <laughs> and that a great number of people believed. You saw that in verse, in verse you know, 19 and 20 and 21. And so revival's happening. Lives are being changed, right? And news of these things, news of this revival at Antioch, the church at Antioch, the news of that revival has come now to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. And they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. Now let me remind you, they did not have Twitter. 
back then. There was no cell phones and Snapchat and, and uh, 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 Internet. There were no, you know, nobody's texting the service. Man, God, hashtag God is in the house. You know, so, you know no, there, there's none of that. None of that stuff is going on in this day and age. It's incredible. And here's this church in Jerusalem miles and miles away, and they hear about this mighty. By the way, can I just say in passing, when God shows up and moves, you really don't have to announce it. The community will know it. They'll be aware of it. Amen. <laughs> Boy, I long to be a part of that. Amen. And so here's this church at Antioch. They hear about this revival, and so they send Barnabas out to go down to Antioch to find out what in the world is going on. Verse 23, last verse, watch this. And so when he came and he had seen the grace of God, he was glad and he encouraged them all that all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. All right, now, here, watch this. Number four, when you have revival, there'll be some obvious results. Things will happen. <laughs> when God's in the house, stuff happens. Can I get an amen? And so here, here's, here's what happens. The church of Jerusalem says, man... I've heard about this revival in Antioch. God is moving. The Bible says early in that text, a great number of people have turned from their sin and believed in the Lord. God is moving. And so they, they take Barnabas and say, hey, look, Barney, get your one bullet, put it in your pocket. Now, some of you teenagers are going to have to Google that, okay? So I'm t Barney Fife, just, t just go Google Barney Fife, F-I-F-E, okay? So you, you get your one bullet, Barney, and you get down there to Antioch, and you find out what's going on, right? And so Barnabas, Barney goes all the way down to Antioch from Jerusalem. Church of Jerusalem sent him out to say, hey, we want to know what God is doing. By the way, I'm the same way when God's moving. I want to know about it, don't you? I want to get in on it, man. I, I want to be a part of it. That's why I was so glad to be invited. I, I hope that some of this spiritual energy tonight will go back to me and kind of rejuvenate and re-energize me and re-energize. I'd love for my folks to say next Sunday, what happened to you, preacher? And I say, well, I drove to Arizona and then... Uh, <laughs> And then I made my way back to Tullahoma, and God got a hold of me at Grace Baptist in Tullahoma. I, I want to take it back with me. And so that's what's happening. They send Barnabas down there to say, man, what is God doing? We'd love to be in on it. And so Barnabas gets there, and when he came, I want you to watch this, and he had seen the grace of God. Now think about this. How do you see the grace of God. It's an interesting phrase, isn't it? It's an interesting, it's a probing thought. He sees the grace of God? How do you see that? What did he see? I, I, I don't know that I have the answer, but I do have a suggestion. He didn't see beautiful buildings. He, he didn't see... Incredible, passionate worship or padded seats. or He didn't see fancy programs. He didn't see elaborate activities. And I, I, I think what he saw was changed lives. He got there and he said, man, I see the grace of God. And I don't, I don't know you personally, but if I did, I could probably say, hey, I, I can see the grace of God in you because I've seen what God is doing in you. He's changed you. I can walk around my church and say, man, I, there's the grace of God and there's the grace of God. And tonight, I could say there's the grace of God and there's the grace of God because He's changed you. You haven't arrived yet, but if I knew you before Jesus, B.C., before Christ, you know, you might have a different way of living, right? And some of your spouses might could, uh, agree with that, man, right? I mean, you kind of recognize, hey, before, you know, before Jesus, man, He, he mean as a snake and angry and, and, and prideful and arrogant. She said, come on, come on, more, more. Anyway, and, and then after Jesus gets a hold of you, he changes you. You hadn't arrived yet. God's still working on you. But listen, I'm not what I want to be, not what I used to be, but thank God I'm not what I was. The grace of God is changing me. And it's changed life. Tonight, I look around this place. Here we are on a Sunday night in the middle of a pandemic. It's crazy, isn't it? And the house is full. And I see these smiling faces, and man, I watched you during worship. 
And I, I could feel, I could hear, I could sense the passion behind your worship. Glory. And I look around this place and I see changed lives. It's as if Barnabas was saying, now I knew you before Jesus. And whoo, I'm going to tell you something. Hey, have you ever, has anybody ever cut you off? And, anybody ever made you mad, cut you off in track, stole your parking place you've been waiting on a long time? Has it ever happened to you? You know, you get to the grocery or somewhere and you're spying at a parking place because it's up close and somebody gets in and they've taken half an hour to pull out. I don't know why they do that. You know, they get in and they're checking their receipt and they're going over the garage. Honey, could you pull out of the parking lot? We got some other people want to get in there. Check your receipt and home amen and so finally she pulls down the, and you start to pull in and somebody zooms around the corner and zooms right into your parking place boy doesn't that try your Christianity come on be honest come on be real with me tonight right it's like boy and you probably even said something like this you better thank God that happened after I met Jesus <laughs> buddy if it hadn't happened I'd have pulled you out of that car and I'd have given you up down one side down the other see, see Jesus changes us he changes. We're not the same people. We hadn't arrived, but we're not what we used to be. He's changing us. I, I think about this precious senior adult who's going through a midlife crisis. I may have told you. And he goes out and he, he, he buys a convertible and he's out speeding and the police pull up behind him, you know. And he decides, I'm not pulling over. I'm speeding up. And he's 8, 60, 80, 90, 100, 120 miles an hour. This policeman still just state troopers falling. Finally comes to a sense of, I'm going to be throwing him. This is crazy. What am I doing? I've lost my mind. He finally pulls over. The state trooper pulls up behind him and says, Sir, what in the world were you doing? I'm going to tell you something. It's Friday afternoon. I'm tired. If you can give me an answer that I've never heard before, I'm just going to let you go free. And without hesitation, this older fella said, well, Mr. Trooper, you're not going to believe this, but several years ago, my wife ran off with a state trooper. And the state trooper said, oh, I'm so sorry. He said, no, 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 I thought you were bringing her back. <laughs> and, and he said, have a good weekend. <laughs> he saw, Jesus is changing us, right? I, I'm just telling you, when God shows up, there's obvious results. You can't continue to be in the presence of God and not be changed. He just changes you. You, you know, you're, he just works on you and he works on this attitude and this. So I'm just mean. My pappy's mean. My grandpappy. We mean folk preacher. She knew what she was getting when she married me. We just mean. No, you can't. You, listen, God won't let you stay mean. Right? He'll, he'll work on you. He'll change you, right? That's what happens, obvious results. So watch this. He sees the grace of God, and then watch this. What's his reaction to seeing the grace of God? What? He was glad. Somebody say that out loud. Come on, ready? He was glad. One more time. He was glad. Isn't that cool? He was glad. So somewhere along the line, I don't think your church, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir, but somewhere along the line, many of our churches have kind of lost that. He sees the grace of God, and he, blessed God, he was glad. Whoo, man. I'm in the presence of Jesus. Man, I see what God is doing. Man, I, I'm in the house of God. We're singing the praises of God. And we're hearing the word of God. Hanging out with the people of God. Man, I could not be, there could, there's not a better. How many of you say, I'm glad to be in the house of God tonight? Come on, Amen. How many of you would rather be here than the best hospital in Tennessee? Come on, amen. It's a good place to be. Look at your neighbor and tell them this is a good place to be. Come on, it's a good place to be. Hey, the Bible says, I was glad when they said unto me, let's go to the house of the Lord. Could I just ask you, where is the gladness in most of our churches? Good night. Most of our churches, we sing these great songs and we forget how awesome our God is and how incredible our salvation is and our sins have been washed away and, and we sing it and look like we've been baptized in prune juice. God forgive us. I mean, you ought to see what we see up here, man. We're singing these great songs. We're preaching our hearts out and we look out there and people are like, I love God, I just hate people. Are you serious? You can't do that. Got your lipstick out so far you can sit on it, swing your legs, you know what I'm saying? That's real encouraging to your preacher. I'm just, sometimes I just want to wake up and say, hey, anybody had their sins forgiven? I tell your face, evidently, it ain't got the message. You know what I'm saying? I'm just telling you, when God shows up, there's going to be a glad, I was glad when they said, let's go to the house of the Lord. The joy, hear me now, I'm almost done. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Where's that joy in most of our churches? 
Where is that gladness? You know, I, I could. they did a study several years ago. And they came up, preacher, you may have seen this. Natural Church Development, NCD, Natural Church Development. And they came up with 10 characteristics of healthy, vibrant churches. It wasn't necessarily the size of the church, the health of the church. Healthy churches. And they tried to kind of come up with 10 characteristics that seemed to be consistent with these healthy, vibrant churches. They came up with 10 characteristics. And I think I remember this right. You know what the third characteristic was? Now, there were a lot of things on there. We would, we would, you know, Bible preaching, of course, you know. You don't hear that much in churches much anymore. They'll talk opinions and tell stories, and, but you don't ever get around to preaching the Word anymore. That's why our nation's in a mess right now. Thank God you have a man of God stand in the pulpit of God and preach the Word of God. Amen? Yeah. And I've listened to him several times on the internet. I'm telling you, he preaches the word. So there was Bible preaching and there was, there was evangelism, you know, discipleship, all the. But the number three characteristic might just rock your world. You know what it was? Number three. And this, 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 this shocked me. Laughter. My first reaction is, well, that's not very spiritual. Laughter. So we're just going to church. It's a circus. That's all we're worried about. We're just, no, no, no. And then I began to realize, yeah, Bible preaching's on there. Evangelism's on there. Discipleship's on there. But don't forget, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Don't forget, I was glad when they said unto me, let's go to the house of the Lord. Don't forget, a, a joyful heart does good like a medicine. And they noticed these churches, there was something about them. They liked to come together. They enjoyed being together. And you could hear the laughter. And you could hear the conversations. And you could hear the fellowship. Folks hanging out before and after the services, six foot apart. But anyway, you know, they're just hanging out, having a good time. You could, you could, you could sense that, just like what we have sensed here tonight. I'm going to tell you, when you're in the presence of God, there will be joy. There will be gladness. I'm not saying there aren't times of heart when God breaks our heart and there are tears, of course. But I'm telling you... What permeates our worship, there should be a sense of awe of who God is, and there should be a sense of gladness that He has done for me what I cannot do for myself. <laughs> yeah, I, listen, I've just decided the older I get, I don't have time to waste time. How many of you know the older you get, the faster it goes? Go. Yeah. How many of you are older than you want to be? How many of you do not know how old you are? Yeah. How many of you do not care how old you are? Anyway, okay. I'm just telling you, the older you get, the faster. And I've just decided, life's passing me by too, and I'm, I don't have time to waste time. So when I come to church, man, I'm going to clear me off a spot, and I'm going to have myself a little Baptocostal fit. Man. God's been too good for me. I'm going to be, he was glad. He was glad. He was glad. He was glad. I just want to tell you, when God shows up, when there's a revival, there's going to be joy in the house. And then this last little challenge, and I'm finished. He comes. Barney shows up. Right? He sees the grace of God. And, man, God's changing lives. He's glad. He's all excited. Then notice what he does. He immediately turns and says, now wait just a second. Thank God for his goodness. Praise God for his grace. It's good to be in the house. I'm glad when they said it's good to be in the house of God. And then he turns right around and says, now wait just a second. He encourages them. That, that word, he challenges them. He encourages them. All that with purpose of heart, they should continue with the Lord. In other words, he's saying, don't get caught up in the euphoria. It's wonderful. Enjoy it. We've had a blast. It's been awesome. We've sang. We've laughed. We've shouted. We've clapped. And Barnabas is saying, man, we've had us a spell. Amen. We've had us a time. It's been awesome. But then he says, very seriously, hang on a second. Don't stop. Stay with the Lord. Stick with Jesus. On the mountain, in the valley. In the sunshine and in the rain. And I'm going to tell you right now, uh, um, it's a challenging time to live out your faith in our world right now. I know we're not under attack like in some third world countries. Right now we're not being thrown in prison. I don't think those days are too far away. But there is a sense of, hmm, Christianity is not very well respected right now. I've been sent here from Birmingham, Alabama to say to you, stick with Jesus. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. It's going to be worth it when we see Him. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take Him at His word. There's nobody like Jesus. Amen? 
Hey, let's have revival. Amen? Man, I want revival, don't you guys? I want You guys need revival. You've been bouncing those babies for 45 minutes now. Good night. I see y'all just keep lugging them around like a football. You take him. You take him. I've had him. You take him. You know? yeah. yeah. Hey, let's have revival. Can I get an amen? Would you stand and let's pray? Come on. Would you stand and let's pray? Matt, your team coming? Yeah, come on. Our pastor's going to be down here. And I don't know what God is... How he's impressed you tonight. It may be some decision you need to make right where you're at. Maybe you want to come to this altar and just clear you off a spot and just say, man, Lord, we need revival. I need revival. My home, my life, my church, my city, my community, my school. Clear you off a spot and just pray for revival. Come by yourself or, or come with your family. Come with your spouse. And all across there, I love the space here, from the right to the left, all the way from one door to the next, you could just flood this place and just pray for revival. If you don't know Jesus, man, Brother Tim going to be right in there. Just come and say, man, I don't think I know him. I don't have that joy. I haven't experienced that release of grace that you talked about tonight. I need to be saved tonight. What a great night to give your life to Jesus. Or maybe you live in this area. Maybe you're from Arizona and you're commuting to Tullahoma. I don't know. <laughs> And you say, man, this is the kind of church I want to be a part of. I, I want to come and, man, I, I'd, I'd like to join. How do I do that? But Tim, right down there and help you. This is your night. Amen. This is the moment. We're not going to linger a long time. Pastor will give us direction. They'll sing for us. This altar's open. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for the freedom to worship. Thank you for the freedom to preach. Thank you for the freedom of your word to permeate our hearts and our lives tonight. Now, God, we don't want to leave here the same way we came. We don't want this to be just another meeting that we have because it was on the calendar. God, we really want to see you move in our churches and in our cities and in our states and in our nation. And oh God, it begins in me tonight. So send a revival. Send a revival. We look to you tonight. In the precious name of Jesus. And just as you remain standing, just with your heads bowed, they'll lead us in some worship, Matt. But this pastor's here. I just want to tell you this altar's open. And there's freedom in this house. So you come tonight. Just, just slip out. If you feel that liberty and that freedom, just come and find you a spot. And just maybe kneel or, or even stand or even, even sit on one of these front pews if you're not able to kneel. Just for a moment to say, God, I'm not leaving here the same way I came. Come on. They'll sing for us. There's freedom in this place. In Jesus' name. Come on. I'm feeling led to change it up a little bit. We are going to sing Great Are You, Lord, which we sang in congregational. But let's worship together the greatness of God.
Take a seat for a moment. Would you agree that God's been in the house? I felt a move, and I hope that you felt that same move. Praise the Lord. Amen. I think the Lord deserves another clap offering. Now, pop back down. <laughs> when I get through preaching on Sunday morning, I'm sweating a lot of times, and somebody will give me a hug, and I say, Pastor, you're soaking wet. I didn't even preach tonight, and I'm soaking wet. <laughs> wow. Um, anyway, we've had a good time, and uh, I pray that we will continue, that we won't walk out of here, and it'll fade away like a cheap perfume, Right? May we continue. We need a shot in the arm. This has been fabulous. Thank you, God. It's so good. Just, I had to confess this afternoon to my mom because my mom taught me growing up, you don't work on Sunday. And uh, she used to scold us if we ever did anything. And I had an ox in the ditch today and I had to finish my yard. Actually, I had to mow the grass to find the ox, okay? So that's uh, what I did this afternoon. I had to mow the yard, but um, while I was mowing the yard, I was praying for tonight. I was praying that, that we'd have a, uh, God would show up and God would show out, but it is, uh, then I, came, I went in the house to shower to get ready and I got a call just, and it was, I thought of this, a young man in our church took his life today. Um, and uh, there's a lot of people. My wife and I were trying to get away yesterday. I said, man, I'm about to just lose it. And before we, leave the, before we left the house, I had two people texting me. I'm hopeless, I'm depressed, I'm at the end of my ropes. Pastor, what do I do, what do I do? Can you call me, can you come over? And I'm like, <sighs> I told him, I said, we gotta have some time just us. And I said, then I started feeling bad saying, what if they commit suicide? But there are a lot of hurting people. And Jesus is the only answer. Jesus is the only answer. And so we have to encourage one another during these days. We have to encourage one another. Not, not discourage, but encourage one another. Just like we've done tonight. It's been good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Good news, bad news. Bad news is I forgot to take the offering last week. Good news is you got a chance to double up tonight, okay? Uh, they said, what happened to the offering? I said, oh, I forgot to mention it. We're not passing the plates right now, but we got some fine-looking, burly, armed men at the door. They're packing. So if you forget, no, nah, they only have one bullet. Uh, <laughs> uh, don't forget to give so we can give to these. They've given us everything they had. They left it all on the playing field tonight, all on the altar. So let's give them ble to them and bless them. Next week, come out. We want to end on a crescendo, high crescendo, on a, on a big note, don't we? And we're going to have outstanding worship again next week. Every week has been outstanding. Every week has been different. Every week has been uh, its own unique uh, characteristic, hasn't it? But every week's been a blessing. And I hope it's been a blessing to you. Next week, we've got Ken Witten, who's going to be flying in. Please join me in this week in praying. His flight lands in Nashville at 3.54 Sunday afternoon. I'll be picking him up and we'll be skedaddling it to Arizona. <laughs> no, I hope we don't. If I get lost, I'll call you, Kevin. No, we may be coming in on a whirlwind. Um, he's coming in, flying in from Tampa, Florida. Robert Russell, right, <clears throat> from New Vision Baptist Church in Murfreesboro, the, the church that Hannah and Mark are part of now, 
is going to be leading us in worship. So it's going to be another great week. Don't get discouraged. I, I've had to, several people said, I invited my one. They didn't come. Don't get discouraged. Keep on keeping on. Keep on keeping on. I invited four today, and none of them came. I was a little bit down, but you know what? I'm not giving up, okay? I'm not going to give up, and you don't give up either. If you didn't get around to inviting your one this, uh, by today, get to them this week, okay? Get to them any week, but especially during these very turbulent, difficult, decisive days. Get them here, okay? Do whatever it takes to get somebody that's unchurched, unsaved here at church. We don't want them to, we don't, nothing wrong with people coming from other churches. They need to be encouraged too, but we're not in the business of stealing church members. If they're happy over there, leave them. If they want to come to something special, great. But that's not who we're going after, okay? We don't, we don't want to swap sheep, right? <laughs> we don't want to swap sheep. We get enough of that. So be encouraged. God bless you. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you, Matt. Man, thank you, praise team. Y'all gave up your Sunday evening to be with us. Thank you, folks. Outstanding crowd. Uh, it really is. And God's been good to protect us through all this. Um, and uh, we, we've just had a wonderful time. We're going to keep on having a wonderful time. Amen? Do you have a song to lead us out on? Or can you, can you sing us out on something? All right. Let's stand and sing this and we'll go out and have a good time. Be encouraged. Amen.